director of the Rule of Law Foundation in The Hague, Netherlands. Uh, and we're pleased to be the venue for the U.S. release of the report, Silent Sectarian Cleansing, Iranian Role in Mass Demolitions and Population Transfers in Syria, which has been assembled by the project group Namasham, or Letter from Syria. Uh, Mr. Hamdan was last here in November 2014. In the intervening period, the journalists and other activists of Nama Sham have assembled the current report, which they submitted formally to the International Criminal Court uh, late in April 2015. Uh, Fouad previewed it uh, in an interview reported this morning in the Wall Street Journal. We look forward to hearing from him now in detail about the report's findings, uh, the actions that Nama Sham have asked of the ICC, and the process ahead and its potential implications. Uh, after Fouad uh, opens with a presentation of about 15 minutes, MEI senior fellow Robert Ford, whom many of you also know as former recent U.S. ambassador in Damascus, uh, will start the conversation and then moderate questions and answers with you here in the audience. Uh, we appreciate your attendance today and we look very much forward to the, uh, the, to the discussion. Before I yield the floor to Robert, I want to call your attention to two further Middle East Institute noon events that are on the schedule for this week, each in a different venue. Uh, on Wednesday, May 20th, we will host a discussion on the prospects for and implications of reconciliation between the governments and the military establishments of Afghanistan and Pakistan. <clears throat> Our speakers will be uh, Walter Anderson of uh, Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, Thomas Lynch of the National Defense University, Khaled Nadiri, also of SAIS, and Reza Rumi of the National Endowment for Democracy. Marvin Weinbaum, director of our Center for Pakistan Studies here at MEI, will moderate that discussion. And uh, we ask you to join us, please, on Wednesday, this Wednesday at noon, at the Carnegie Endowment Building over on Massachusetts Avenue for that event. The following day, uh, Thursday, May 21st, uh, the Middle East Institute and the European Union Institute for Security Studies, EUISS, will host uh, Dennis Chaibi from the US, the EU mission to the US, uh, Florence Gaub, uh, a scholar at EUISS, MEI scholar Ross Harrison, and Alan Pino from the US National Intelligence Council for a discussion about the trends and drivers shaping the Middle East over the decade ahead. MEI Vice President for Policy and Research, Paul Salem, will moderate that discussion, which we will hold at the Human Rights Campaign Building just around the corner from here on Rhode Island Avenue at 17th Street. With those announcements done and repeated thanks to all of you, uh, all of you here in the audience today in the Boardman Room, and to those who are watching on video, I'm pleased to introduce Mr. Fouad Hamdan, and Ambassador Robert Ford. Robert. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. And uh, let me welcome everyone here to the Middle East Institute. Uh, today's program, I think, is exceptionally important. And it's a great opportunity to look in detail at one of the key aspects of the ongoing Syrian crisis. And I want to just remind everyone, all of the people here, and those that are also watching on television, that the Syria conflict really matters. It is not a sideshow in some distant land in the Middle East. It is the biggest human tragedy in the world today, with over 200,000 people killed. Just in the past week, regime Syrian government aircraft struck the town of Menbij and killed dozens and dozens of civilians. Similarly, the Syrian government's airstrikes in Idlib and Aleppo provinces have killed hundreds of people, not over the last year, just in the past 10 days. Uh, and more to the point for Americans, we have United States Air Force pilots daily flying combat runs over Syria and over Iraq to fight the Islamic State. And all analysts agree that the conflict in Syria has facilitated the Islamic State's advances in both Syria and Iraq. 
Naam Shem is a group of Iranian activists and civilian journalists that have studied carefully the Syrian conflict and one key aspect of this important conflict is absolutely essential conflict moving the Middle East. Naam Shem has delved deeply into the Iranian role in the Syrian conflict. Now, the Iranian role in the Syrian conflict, I think all analysts in government and out of government here in Washington, all analysts would agree that the Iranian role in Syria is extremely important. They watch it with keen, keen interest. And there is large agreement that without Iranian assistance to the Bashar al-Assad regime, the Bashar al-Assad regime either would have collapsed or at least had to go to the negotiating table. The Iranians increased aid substantially to the Assad regime beginning in 2013. And that surge in Iranian support gave the regime and hardliners in the regime a lifeline to continue the policies that we have seen. And I mentioned the airstrikes just over the past week to 10 days. Naam Sham, in November 2014, issued a very detailed report, I recommend it to everyone here, you can get it on the internet, about the Iranian policies to help the Bashar al-Assad regime in Syria. It's very detailed. They concluded that the Iranian presence in Syria was like that of an occupation force and should be subjected to the same international legal conventions as found in things such as the Geneva Conventions. Today, Fouad Hamdan, who is the campaign director for Naime Sham, will discuss the findings of his latest, his team's latest report. But I also want to underline that Fouad Hamdan is himself a legal expert. He is the executive director for the Rule of Law Foundation, which is in the Netherlands. This is an independent, non-government organization. It's a foundation. It does grants. Um, working to promote rule of law in Arab countries, and it is entirely independent. In addition, he also works as campaign director for Naame Sham, and in that capacity, we're delighted to have you here today, Fouad, to talk about your report and its latest, latest findings. Thank you so much for coming. Please. My speech. Okay, hi, thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Middle East Institute, and everybody there for the honor of speaking here and launching our new report. Um, just a few sentences about our group. We are a mix of uh, Lebanese, Syrians, and Iranians living all in exile in Europe. Yeah? And uh, for the obvious reasons, as you know, we cannot go home anymore until uh, the regimes change in the area and become a bit more democratic. We are funded solely by a couple of personal friends of mine. We are fully politically and economically independent from governments, political parties, and so on. And we are secular uh, Shia. <laughs> Finally, we are all Shia Muslims, you know, on paper at least. But we are all secular, progressive people, you know, so you know with whom you're talking, yeah, and who's behind it. Um, so they have, um, the report we are, we're going to publish uh, today is about the silent sectarian cleansing happening in Syria. There have been frequently been news reports and unconfirmed rumors about emptying certain areas of Syria of their Sunni residents and replacing them with Shia and Alawi supporters of the Syrian and Iranian regimes. More than four years after the start of the revolution and the subsequent war, with millions of displaced Syrians and many of their homes destroyed or expropriated, the international community is not acting to stop what appears to be a silent sectarian cleansing taking place in Syria. Our new report focuses on this very issue. It looks into two specific war crimes and crimes against humanity being committed in certain parts of Syria. The unlawful destruction and appropriation of civilian property and the forcible di displacement and transfer of the civilian population in, from these areas. Together, these two types of crimes constitute what appears to be a state policy of sectarian cleansing. It is driven by a combination of mafia-style war profiteering 
linked to the inner circle of the Syrian regime and a Shiitization program pushed and financed by the Iranian regime and implemented with the help of Hezbollah Lebanon. My voice is too low? Okay, I have to get closer. Well, in the report, we accuse the Assad regime and its Iranian and Hezbollah backers of attempting to change with unlawful means the demographic composition of certain areas of Syria, such as Damascus and Homs. Satellite images, such as those published by the UN, show vast urban areas raised to the ground in these areas. These demolitions appear to have been intended to cleanse those areas of all unwanted elements, the majority of whom appear to be Sunni Muslim and prevent them from returning to their homes in the future. The number of affected people could be in the hundreds of thousands. Yeah? Let me show you some examples of photos. Here you have a satellite photo of the, made by the UN. By the way, you will have the report at the entrance uh, downstairs uh, when you leave with all the photos and so on. You can download in high resolution all these photos from the internet. Here you have demolitions in Tadamon district in Damascus. You can see how everything has been raised. Here you have demolitions around Mizzi airport in Damascus. There they are creating something like a Dahli, like in southern Beirut. And you have here demolition examples in Hama, Wadi al Jewish district in Hama, totally destroyed. And in uh, Mash'a al, -Arab, al Arbim in Hama also, totally raised to the ground. Kabun district in Damascus. And here you have an example, one of the very, very few examples where it was filmed, what these guys were doing. It's extremely difficult to have photos on the ground of what's happening in Syria. People who just walk around with a mobile like this are finished, are dead in a second. So it's extremely rare to have something like that. The sources of these photos here are from Human Rights Watch and the UN. Just to give you an idea of what we have been doing, um, what we did with this report is to gather many, many pixels you know, and do all the research and create an image about the sectarian pleasing happening there. These NGOs or the UN and Human Rights Watch, they showed what's happening there, but they focused more on the issue of um, demolitions, unlawful demolitions uh, and, and displacement and, pun and mass punishment of people. We went a step further and said, okay, if it's happening there, where is, where is it also happening and what does it mean? It's more than just punishing people. It's basically pushing away people out forever, yeah, and changing the demographics and carrying out a sectarian cleansing. So, for example, the documented demolitions in the Mazdi area in southern Damascus appear to be a continuation of a long-standing plan of creating an Iranian zone there, similar to the Hezbollah stronghold in Al-Dahya in southern Lebanon, southern Beirut. The Syrian and the Iranian regimes have also been buying, either directly or through agents, property en masse in Hamas, Damascus, and to a lesser extent in Aleppo. They have also been legally stealing property by falsifying official documents or forging people to sell their property, especially in Damascus. The Syrian regime is sugarcoating sometimes, sugarcoating these crimes with laws. One example, in May 2014, the Syrian Ministry of Justice published a proposal for a, I'm quoting now, comprehensive revision, unquote, of rental law number one of 2006, allowing authorities to, quote, open houses abandoned by their owners and renting them to other Syrian citizens under the supervision of a special government committee, unquote. It's a, it's a disaster what's happening there. You know. Meanwhile, the so-called reconstruction projects are being implemented by old new mafias linked to the inner circles of the Syrian and Iranian regimes. Who's involved? Some names you may know, like Rami Makhlouf's company, Sham Holding, Iyad Ghazal's cartel group, the Damascus and Homs city councils, and possibly also the Iranian Revolutionary Guard construction and engineering arm, Khatim al -Anbiya. Various Iranian officials also appear to be implicated in these schemes, which amounts to war crimes and crimes against humanity under international law. These include the Iranian ambassador to Syria, the Iranian mediator in Homs known as Hajj Fadi, Iranian businessman, and the Iranian revolutionary command, and probably also Iranian revolutionary guards commanders. The main person implicated naturally will be General Qasem Soleimani, 
the head of the Quds Force, the foreign arm of Sepah Pasdaran, the revolutionary guys of uh, Iran. Here you have a photo of General Qasem Soleimani on the southern front line around Dara. It was made by regime supporters early January, early, end January, early February, after a failed offensive of these guys in the area. And it's written in Arabic, the heroic achievements of the Syrian army. Well, I leave it like that. It, I, think, I think it says a lot itself. We argue that the ultimate aim of these sectarian cleansing schemes is to secure the damascus homs coast corridor along the Lebanese border. This is it. What these guys are doing you know, is preparing probably yeah, for, a for, for, a, for two Syrias. One along that red line, which the Pasdaran, the Iranian Revolutionary Guards, Hezbollah, and the remains of what is the regime and so on control, with a mainly Shi uh, Alawi population with many Shia inside, and Alawis becoming Shia, and a few maybe Sunni refugees, or they will kick them out. And the rest of Syria, if nothing happens to stop the war in Syria as soon as possible, you will have there, I don't know how many Islamic states. ISIS Islamic State, Daesh, uh, Ajabat al Nusra Islamic State, uh, Sham, whatever, you know, and so on. So we're heading, I have the feeling, in that direction more and more. But these guys want to protect the corridor, Damascus, Hama, Homos, and the coast, so that they continue getting weapons to Hezbollah via Syria and to Lebanon. So the goal is to both provide a geographical and demographic continuity of regime held areas and secure arms shipments to Hezbollah in Lebanon. Here we need to ask ourselves, why is the Iranian regime so determined to save Bashar al-Assad's regime and take over control at, of Syria at any cost? Point number one, the Iranian regime wants to maintain its ability to ship arms to Hezbollah in Lebanon via Syria. Remember the UN revolution of, in 2006, which bans any shipments of arms to Hezbollah via Lebanon. Since then, everything comes via Syria. So you have a total dependency. So this lifeline will ensure maintaining a strong deterrent against any possible Israeli or Western attack on Iran's nuclear facilities. It's a, line of it's a line of defense for Iran and for the Iranian regime. It is meant to secure the Iranian regime's survival. Because if the Assad regime falls, Hezbollah militarily will fall. It will not be able to get any more weapons. It cannot be any more a deterrent force and the Iranian regime will feel threatened and basically can scrap its military nuclear dreams forever. Yeah. Back to our new report. It, it provides various examples and indicators, but it notes that more evidence is needed to determine the scale and all the perpetrators of the war crimes and crimes against humanity, humanity committed currently in Syria. You know, when we did our report last year, Iran and Syria, from an ally of the regime to an occupying force, we also gathered many pixels from everywhere, research and so on, but the picture was very sharp. We could really say there is no more Iranian regime. Yeah? It's a hull. Everything is controlled economically, militarily, by the Iranians, you know, the Pasdaran and the Hezbollah. But in this case, we have a picture, but it needs much more research from international bodies or, and so on. Let me show you something. Ah, yeah, to visualize the Iranian de facto occupation of uh, Syria, we created this image of uh, General Qasem Soleimani on the Syrian back note. Yeah? I am very happy it is amusing. <laughs> okay. Nevertheless, I th we think there is enough uh, leads to warrant a systematic investigation by concerned international bodies, such as the International Criminal Court, ICC, in The Hague. This should include the role of Iranian officials and commanders, particularly General Qasem Soleimani. The crimes discussed in our report clearly fall within the jurisdiction of the ICC, as the second chapter explains, and the prosecutor, we believe, should use the powers bestowed upon her by the Rome Statute to initiate an international investigation into them even if this is not vetoed, even if, if this is vetoed by Russia and China at the UN Security Council. The ICC prosecutor, we believe, should also accept an offer made public in March 2015 by the UN Independent International Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic. The commission's chairman, Mr. Paolo Pinero, said he was ready to share names and details from a secret list of suspects with any prosecution authorities preparing the case. 
or cases in Syria, including the ICC. And we also call on the US and its allies basically to do the following. That's why I'm here now for about 10 days to lobby, talk to people, convince, inform, and so on. We would like the US and its allies to do the following. Link the current nuclear talks with Iran's role in the region. Tell the Iranian negotiators in Geneva, no lifting of sanctions before you give up the bomb and end your support to the regime in Syria. Impose no-fly zones to protect civilians and allow humanitarian access throughout Syria in line with the international responsibility to protect norm. That is, if the UN, at the UN again, the Russians and the Chinese veto any resolution in that direction. But we don't want a no-fly zone implemented now like that. If, the, if you implement it now, the regime may collapse very quickly. But then the ones who will take over the country will be a mix of loonies from Daesh to Jabhat al-Nusra and so on. We don't want that. So we want that a no-fly zone is part of a strategy because it can only work as part of the strategy of arming and training enough moderate Syrian rebels not only to fight ISIS, but the Assad regime, the Iran Revolutionary Guards, and Hezbollah in Lebanon. The people in Syria need to know that they did not make a mistake in March 2011 when they went to the streets and demanded freedom and dignity. Millions of Syrian refugees need to believe that they will be able to return to their homes and that justice will prevail. And we think that these four guys should one day, should one day enter through the doors of that building. Yeah? The ICC cannot cope maybe more than four or five extra super cases, and the rest can be hopefully one day um, be worked on in courts in Syria for the hundreds of thousands of criminals of war there. But these four guys, Qasim Soleimani, top left, Bashar al-Assad, Mr. Isis al-Baghdadi, and Nasrallah, the head of the Hezbollah in Lebanon, we believe they belong inside there. Thank you very much. The, the great joy of being a moderator at an event like this is you get to ask the first questions. So, Fuad, thank you very much. And um, I'm not going to comment on your, your design for a new currency in Syria. <laughs> uh, the currency is losing value rapidly in any case as, because the, of that phase. as, yes. as the regime's economy gets worse and worse. So, um, I'd like to start. Uh, you've, you've raised a lot of interesting points, clearly, and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions. But I'd like I'd like to draw on your legal expertise. Mm -hmm. And you have now made accusations that mm -hmm. some of the gentlemen whose pictures you showed mm -hmm. um, are responsible for crimes, war crimes, mm -hmm. under uh, the Geneva Conventions and even under the Rome Statutes. And I would like you, um, for the audience here and for the people on television, um, to talk a little bit about what elements of the Geneva Convention and the Rome Statute you think have been violated? What is the legal case, the legal case, mm -hmm. um, where actions on the ground are in contravention mm -hmm. with international uh, law? Okay. Look, first one really has to shift a little bit the way you think about the Syrian regime. I don't like to talk about the Syrian regime because, in our opinion, it doesn't exist since 2013. It's finished. It's basically an occupied country. The regions, the so-called regime-held areas, are occupied by the Pasdaran and Hezbollah. In our report, the previous one, and if you go also to other websites and other institutions that cover what's going on there, Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, and so on, you will see that many massacres and crimes against humanity happened in Syria since 2011, committed by regime people. We're not talking about ISIS, we know that. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Let's focus a bit more about, about these guys. We know partly, quite often, who did that, who were participating in the crimes, what units of the Syrian army or Shabiha participated in many of the crimes, like Baida and so on. Yeah? And we know that not a single military operation in Syria can occur without knowing, without the Iranians, commanders there and the Hezbollah commanders knowing, allowing, or even ordering it, because it was part of some operation there. And if they didn't know it and were not 
and were not and did not order it or did not notice, then they are nevertheless responsible for what's happening in areas they occupy. That's part of international law. When you are a force that is controlling an area, you are responsible of the population you are occupying. You cannot say, oh, sorry, I didn't notice, I didn't know somebody else did it. Sorry, you are responsible, you're controlling that area. So that's one of the law, um, international um, points that these guys basically, where you can catch them on that point, including the war crimes and crimes against humanity. They're also not playing their uh, role as a good occupier who takes care of the people they're occupying, in the contrary, they're not doing that. Yeah. So we have films and documentations, and not only us, but many other institutions also are doing that. Not many others, but a few very professional ones. One of them is represented here. Yeah. They are collecting all this information. The ICC, in our opinion, can, according to numerous points in the Rome Statute, in the Geneva Convention, you know, I will spare you the details of the legal sentences and so on. Half of that report is about the legalities and why it is possible to send these people to jail and to try them before. It's all inside. Every single legal detail. We have one of our legal experts, Shiar, went to well, a couple of weeks in London and with a couple of other experts who helped us on that. It's all formulated. It's basically I'm sorry to say it for Mr. Soleimani, it's bulletproof. We can get him legally if somebody starts, starts the process at the ICC. Um, let me then open it up to the floor. First, let me welcome Andrew Tabler from the Washington Institute. And Andrew, first question is yours. Thank you, Fouad, for that, um, that very interesting presentation. And I can't wait, wait to read your report. Um, it's depressing, Andrew. It's not nice to read. It's very bad. I, um, you will have nightmares. <laughs> I already have a lot Don't of nightmares. Don't blame me. Syria nightmares. No, no, I, I, I can understand that. Um, I'm going to ask you a question about actually getting to, concerning the ICC. Um, until now, we haven't really seen a lot of activity on that front. Uh, there have been a lot of arguments one way or the other yeah. about going to the ICC or not going to the ICC. Can you explain to us a little bit about why do you think we haven't seen action at the ICC mm -hmm. based on these activities yeah. so far? And, yeah. um, and uh, also a little bit about um, how you think your report would contribute to mm -hmm. that case. And I realize you can't go into tremendous detail, but in yeah. broad brushstrokes. Yeah. Thank you. Look, the general knowledge is that the ICC does not start a process against anybody unless the UN Security Council gives, you know, has a resolution, start, you know, investigating this or that. or if a member state of the ICC says, in my country something is happening which is very bad in some areas, please start, up, start something. Or the individuals of a member state are killed and massacred in another country, then they can tell the, the ICC, please start an investigation. This is the general knowledge. And when I was sitting with my team and discussing that half a year ago, um, they were telling me, forget it, it's hopeless. They cannot do anything unless something happens at the UN or a member state gives an order. So I sent my super expert, Shiar, to London, and he sat for three days reading books and books until he found a sentence inside in the Rome Statute saying the ICC prosecutor can start on his or her own an investigation, full point, without anything else. They don't need anybody else to do it because it makes a little bit no sense if you have such a huge body, UN body in The Hague sitting there watching uh, a country falling apart, people being massacred and killed, uh, kicked out, and so on, and they don't do nothing. It's impossible to understand. So it's possible they can do it. So we gave them, we went, I went to the ICC on the 23rd of April, gave them all the reports, and now the ICC prosecutor's office is studying the material we gave them, and they have to come back to us in, by two months, maximum, by the end of June, and tell us whether they're gonna start an investigation, or whether they're gonna not start an investigation, but then they have to say why. Or they can tell us also, we need some more time to study what you have given us, and we will get back to you, inshallah, bukra marish, whatever, you know, at some point, okay? Yeah, please. So basically we are now, we opened the door. I hope I, we opened the door for jail for these people, you know, I hope, I hope. I'm Mona Alami, I'm a non-resident fellow with Atlantic Council and journalist. Uh, there are thousands of documents that 
that have been gathered by the Commission for International Justice and Accountability against Assad. Can these two cases be linked in a way, mm. or have you thought of mm -hmm. linking these two cases together because they complete each other okay. in okay. a way? Okay, I met uh, my friend uh, Muhammad, uh, who is the executive director of that institution a few days ago, and what these guys are doing is, first of all, an amazing job. They are gathering information, information, information about who's doing what, films, videos, documents, and so on, yeah? You know, they are very important for the ICC if the ICC decides, uh, decides to start an investigation, because if they ever decide to do that, I am sure Muhammad will get a phone call telling him, can you give us the, a copy of everything you have? And he will be, I think, very glad to do that. More than glad, even. Yeah. Maybe if you if, um, introduce yourself. Sure. Yeah. My name is Mohammed Abdullah. I'm the director of Syria Justice and Accountability Center. It's a different institute from CIGA, but oh, we, we partner with oh. them and we have we have copies of all the all mm -hmm. the extracted documents, basically, and could simply be linked mm -hmm. to these cases. And that's part of the discussion we've had, uh, mm -hmm. or we had we had on Friday. Uh, I have two questions and, and a mm -hmm. comment. One, responding to Ambassador Ford's question on the legality of of, of the of the. Uh, attacks here or the uh, violations under IHL international humanitarian law. If you provide security assistance to any country, you're accountable for what they do on this. And that's precisely why the NATO have not really engaged with more directly with the rebels in Libya because the NATO could be accountable for our crimes. That's one one of the bases in the report. And I'm sorry I couldn't review the entire report within the weekend. But uh, I have two questions. One, you mentioned uh, it's constitute a state policy of sectarian cleansing and. The data we've collected shows that the government is trying to bomb these areas where their activity is happening, their protest or mm -hmm. and armed component. So mm -hmm. a counter argument could be, I'm here just asking for the discussion, mm -hmm. why other Sunni areas are not being erased? Mm -hmm. I mean, the line you draw, it's, it makes mm -hmm. perfect sense, it's being targeted here, but there's other areas out of this area being targeted. My city, the resort under ISIS now was yes. wiped and, and, and yes. similar. Mm -hmm. thing. And Aleppo, same thing. Mm -hmm. And my second question, your map reminded me, if you can go back to the map, reminded me of a proposal by Professor Joshua Landis, except nobody, except Farid Zakaria talked that seriously. Mm -hmm. Josh put a line between half north of Syria and half south and put Latakia with the northern side and said, this is where both the rebels and the southern part will stay with Assad mm -hmm. control. And my question to Josh, which he failed to, to respond to, why the Assad state will succeed despite the fact it has a high majority mm. Sunni again. Even if you divide Syria yes. and leave Aleppo, yes. the resort, and other areas, yes. still you have Latakia, Jabla, you have Hama, Idlib, yes. you have yes. Damascus, Damascus suburb, which is high majority Sunnis. Besides that, Turkey, and that little green finger, Liwa Iskenderun, it has high Alawite population. who used to be Syrians before 1936. But those people might rebel against the Turkish government. So Turkey will not allow this to happen, to have Alawite states in mm. this southern border. So, Mm -hmm. Some some reports suggesting this it's a bit over realistic, if I would say, or mm -hmm. exaggerated a little bit that the regime with the Iranians are splitting the country okay. based on sectarian borders. Thanks. Okay. Yes. First, they're not doing that. This is Plan B. If everything else collapses, this is where they will retreat. Okay. Their goal is not to have an, an, a state they control there and give up the rest. This is not what they want. But if everything collapses and, uh, and the rebels receive enough weapons and support and they cannot hold any more Tadmor and Aleppo and all these majority Sunni areas, that this is plan B. It's not plan A. Okay? All right? This, and you're right. They're bombing also areas where no fighting is happening, of course, because they're still trying to hold to Tadmor, to their Zur, to come back to the border, to get the border along the Golan Heights and so on. They still did not give up all of that. They gave up some areas, but they're still trying to fight for the rest. Yeah, that's normal. But if plan B happens and we have a disastrous situation, I don't want to even imagine what might happen to hundreds of thousands of Sunni refugees in the areas which they control. Who knows what will happen then if they kick them out with something. There are many horrible scenarios when plan B happens. And how this red line is afterwards, I have no clue. But this is, how do you say, the growth idea, yeah? They might lose maybe the line, the border to the Takiyya and so on, we don't know that. This is, you know, speculation. But this is, in general, broad lines of Plan B. And it's a horror scenario. I would like to remember, remind you of something. A year ago when I was 
No, no, no. In 2013, when the red line was not implemented and U.S. President Obama decided to lead from behind, yeah, we said, guys, you know, by not doing that, you are basically leading to a situation that where at some point you will have more and more jihadis and Islamists controlling the rebellion. And this is exactly what happened with the Islamic State. If now for the next one and a half year until Obama leaves office, nothing happens and we continue having this so-called attrition war in Syria, yeah, that could be what we see in two years or one and a half year. Okay? And if you have that, you can imagine the, impl the, impl the, impl the implication, the security implication for the whole region. Yeah? And numerous Islamic states killing each other, shooting at the others, and chaos. Please. Building exactly on this point, how would they be behaving on the ground, militarily, yeah. Hezbollah and the regime forces, to give us an idea that Plan B is now starting to be implemented? What would you be looking for? in their mm -hmm. behavior on the ground to sh give us mm -hmm. an, uh, an indication that this is, in fact, time now mm -hmm. has shifted to plan. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they already started very quickly by 2012, 2013, shifting a lot of weaponry and so on in, that, in these areas. Yeah? Plan B is in their head since, I would say, 2013 at least. Yeah? And it's military. You know? More, everything is almost there. Yeah? In the case, things collapse in the other regions. Yeah? But in these areas, the Sunni refugees who are living there, the internal dis uh, internally displaced and the ones who, who always lived there, they are under very strong scrutiny. Yeah? And they feel threatened. And whoever can leave the country is leaving. And they are not trying to keep them there. Okay? You know, who wants to leave, leave. Bye-bye. Allah -bye. Okay? But there is no other things we know where, they, where we can say they're preparing for that. But in a military strategic way, we know it from our Hezbollah sources people inside Hezbollah and contacts there, that they are preparing for Plan B since 2013. In any case, okay, let them have the rest, we don't care. They say it bluntly, let them have them and let them kill each other, all these Sunnis and crazy people, and we have that and the rest, we don't care. Paul. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I mean, when looking at areas that are being destroyed, uh, mm. that we've seen the maps of mm -hmm. and so on, Methodolo methodologically, mm. and in terms of evidence and so on, how can you distinguish between, maybe let's go back to what Muhammad said, mm. areas that they're wiping out because there was resistance or mm -hmm. because they want to defeat whoever mm -hmm. is there? Mm -hmm. uh, be, how do you distinguish between that methodologically and a plan mm -hmm. of sectarian cleansing and replacement by new populations, mm -hmm. which is a whole process yeah. because yeah. definitely you're going to find mm -hmm. destroyed neighborhoods mm -hmm. uh, that simply might be part of the war mm -hmm. but you're saying no there's a certain there's something else going on yes displacement and bringing in through mm -hmm. the rent law and so on others to take their places yeah. this also raises the question that obviously the places they're bringing people into cannot be completely destroyed also Exactly. So, uh, so what evidence mm -hmm. or approach mm -hmm. to make the case that this is not just war, there's also a whole yes. displacement mm -hmm. and replacement taking yeah. place? Yeah. We, de we detail many examples where after some areas where rebels were there or where demonstrations happened and shooting and bombing and some destruction happened because of war, you know, but not everything was destroyed, maybe 20, 30, 40 percent, but afterwards they raised everything. So why do you do that? Voila, <laughs> they do it afterwards. And in Damascus, they cannot do that. It's a bit too much. Yeah? Only around Mezzi, it's a bit far away, and where they have big war zones, you know, to protect themselves. But inside Damascus, we know from our sources there that hundreds of people are being regularly, you know, thousands, you know, threatened, pressured, offered money just to leave. Yeah? Some they disappear. And many people left because they're, you know, because they were afraid for their security. And then suddenly afterwards, we found that inside you have Alawis and Shia. We know of about 40 Shia schools already, Shia religious school in Damascus, and a very big one near Latakiyi, with about 1,000 students. And they are Shia religious schools where Alawi families send their children. Hold on, Alawi families? Then they're not Alawi anymore if they're sending their children to a Shia religious school where they are indoctrinated. Hezbollah and Pasdaran, you know, they are very smart. They work long term. You know, these guys are strategic. Yeah? They're not stupid. You know? okay? They know what they're doing. 
They are brainwashing these people like Hezbollah did it with the Shia population of Lebanon with the help of the Iranians since 1983 in Lebanon. It's a long process, yeah, okay? And they are placing Alawis who become Shia in many of these districts in Damascus who became basically closed zones. We, none of our uh, sources in Damascus is able to enter them. We tried, <laughs> but it's impossible. Only people who have a permit, somebody knows them, can go in. And you cannot take up like this and start photographing something. No way. But we know it, 40 Syrian schools. And more and more examples inside that give this picture, which is sharp enough for us to claim you have a systematic sectarian state, you know, organized sectarian things happening, but more needs to be done. We don't want to be the only ones working on that. That's why I'm here, that's why we're publish publicizing it, to ignite a process, please. <clears throat> My name is Tom Dine. Uh, are there any Arab countries, Sunni Arab countries particularly, who would support an effort at The Hague? I don't, I don't, I don't know that. I don't know that. I, so it's, it's a, it's a I think this is something, you know, the, the thing is with the Syrian revolution, we have on the one hand, our American and Allah friends and uh, Western allies who are basically only leading from behind, yeah, which is a problem, as you see. You know, not enough uh, moderate rebels being trained, only 90 now, finally. It's not enough, we need 90,000. Yeah? And don't, we're not asking for Iran, uh, for the US or Israel or anybody to bomb Iran. We're against that. Yeah? But we are for a very clear message to the Iranian regime you have a couple of months to stop doing what you're doing in Syria, to disarm Hezbollah, to end this, or else we're going to fight you with the help of thousands of Syrians we're going to train and arm to liberate that country and introduce at some point the rule of law. Okay? Arab countries who are allies of the Syrian rebellion are not, unfortunately, democracies. You know? And I don't think they're going to be the ones pushing or something at the IAC. That's why we are here to ask the U.S. to push a little bit in that direction, or European countries. But you indicated in your talk hmm. that the Western countries, not just the United States, are linking their efforts in this part of the world basically to a, a, a deal with Iran. So who's, who's going to go to the Hague? We would like to have U.S., the U.S., and other Western nations asking the ICC to start an investigation, to, to give them a call, yeah, and to tell them if you need more resources, because it costs more money to work with all of that mess in Syria, because it's, as Ambassador Ford said, the biggest tragedy happening today, meaning many cases, these guys would need resources, meaning cash money for that also, right? If the Saudis would like to fund it, fine. I have no problem with it, <laughs> okay? The gentleman in black in front of you. Thank you. Sir. Sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Samir Sumaydi. I am a former ambassador from Iraq uh, to the United States. Uh, Qasem Soleimani uh, has an interest and writ that extends well beyond Syria and to yes. other mm -hmm. areas. And Iraq is one of them. And I know the focus of this presentation is Syria, mm -hmm. but what is happening in Iraq is not completely dissociated mm -hmm. with Absolutely. what's happening in Absolutely. Syria. Have you um, collected any information about sectarian cleansing mm -hmm. that is taking place, mm -hmm. conducted by militias, mm -hmm. led indirectly, sometimes directly, by a Quds force, Qasem Soleimani in particular? Mm -hmm. there is a uh, belt around Baghdad, there's an yes. area, Jorf al -Sakhar. I can, yes. if you want, supply numbers and mm -hmm. even names of families who have been evicted. Mm -hmm. There are areas in Diyala, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, bordering on Iran, which mm -hmm. have been, uh, th this cleansing policy has been implemented viciously. Mm -hmm. uh, there are facts and figures. Have you been interested in that? Mm -hmm. Do you have any Shia Iraqis with you? <laughs> <laughs> and, and is it a qualification to be a member of your group? Well, no, no, not at all. It's just, it's just a coincidence because I think we have in our group the, the best professional uh, Syrian campaigner ever. Yeah? You will not find somebody like that. 
he's Shia, sorry, you know, and I'm also Shia, sorry. I'm, what should I say? You know, I'm very secular. For us, it doesn't, you know, doesn't make a difference. Look, our group is focusing on, on the role of Iran and Hezbollah in Syria. We, two of in our team are Iranians who fled the country in 2009, journalists who were beaten, tortured, arrested, you know, in the, in the you know, in, when, when the Green Revolution happened there and failed, and they fled to Europe there in exile. These people monitor for us all the Iranian state-controlled media <laughs> online. And these guys have such a big ego that they report a lot what they're doing. You know? They cannot control their ego sometimes. So we have screenshotted and researched everything what these guys are doing and translated for our reports, what they're doing in Syria. And there's a lot about Iraq we find there also. But we're not collecting that. It's too much work. We cannot do everything. We know that Human Rights Watch and Amnesty has produced a couple of reports in the direction, and I think they're doing a very good job. Yeah? But uh, linking that, what, in our opinion, by the way, in some areas of Iraq, a sectarian change is happening, but it has not been said. You know? it, has been, it has not been said like that. Yeah? It, it, but it's happening. It's happening. But I don't have a report on that. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, let, let's, let others, uh, my father, please, and then, yeah. <coughs> before I give the word to a second. So. Hi, my name is Johnny Dilan from Voice of America, Kurdish Service. Uh -huh. uh, when we talk about the war, the casualty of war, and the crime has been committed, and we held Iran as is responsible mm -hmm. for supporting uh, Assad regime, mm -hmm. what about those entities, parties, countries that are supporting ISIS, Mm -hmm. Nusra and other mm -hmm. group, mm -hmm. you know, there's accusation that uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar supporting them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, my second question, is it possible to talk about Syria without mentioning the Kurds, their suffering, their struggle, yes. their yes. resistance, yes. the role of their fighters, uh, especially yes. the women? Yeah. Thanks. Look, be assured, be assured that we in our group, you know, don't like ISIS, Jabhat al-Nusra, Al-Qaeda, and all these people. And we are very clear in our demand that we should not start any fight against the Iranian regime in Syria, against the Pasdaran and the Hezbollah, without at the same time fighting ISIS and Al-Qaeda. It has to be together. For us, both of them are as horrible as each other. They are basically the other side of the coin of horror, which we call, yeah? But we are focusing on them. Everybody knows what ISIS is doing, and these guys, you know, are just horrible, and everybody's saying it, and, and it's reported more than enough about it. This is a part of the horror in Syria where not enough is being said about. Okay, that's why we're focusing only on that. So it's not because we don't care about the Kurds or the other areas where ISIS is killing people and beheading them in the contrary. We want all these guys away, these killers, to protect minorities like the Kurds, to protect the Shia and the Alawis in the area and so on. And I'm talking now to you as a Shia. What my brothers and sisters of the Hezbollah are doing in Lebanon and Syria, this is going to be the biggest, you know, the consequence will be the biggest disaster for the Shia communities in the region. I am unfortunately, you know, confident or afraid that we are going to, we Shia in Lebanon and in Syria, we're going to pay a bitter price for doing what Hezbollah is doing in the area. Okay? A very bitter price. And our work is basically trying to prevent that, to stop the killing and to prevent another disaster. Because at some point, when, F, when we have plan B or something in that direction, I don't want to think about the horror scenarios of Alawis refugees fleeing somewhere and massacres and whatever, you know, and what happens in Lebanon with the Shia community. If this happens or if something breaks and they will not be able to get weapons anymore from Syria, Hezbollah, and Iran will free Stangled, I think at any second then afterwards you might have another war between Israel and Hezbollah like 2006. And that will be more horrible than anybody can imagine. The Israelis are repeatedly saying they're prepared, yeah? And Hezbollah is suicidal enough to send enough missiles on Tel Aviv to provoke such a war. If they feel this is it, we're falling in Syria, we're losing it, then let's go for it. We go down and we pull down as many people as possible with us. The problem with Hezbollah and the Iranian regime is that they are, they have a mix of qualities in, in brackets, yeah? They are highly intelligent, highly educated. They have a lot of money, power, yeah? They have weapons. And they have an ideology which is suicidal. So you have a very toxic mix of qualities with these guys, okay? Very toxic mix. And the Iranian regime will fight until the last Shia 
in Lebanon, the last Alawi in Syria, and the last Shia in Iraq also, or the Houthi in Yemen, to get the bomb, to get the bomb. If they have the bomb, they won't care for that. They will not do that anymore. They won't care. They want to secure the regime. They want to feel safe with the bomb behind them so they can negotiate with everybody in the world and say, okay, now away with the sanctions or else I can make trouble. If a little loony in North Korea can make so much problems in the region with a couple of little nuclear bombs, you can imagine what these guys can do, you know, pressure-wise, when they have it. And that's what they want, to survive. Sorry, yeah. My question is, demographics are clearly not in the Assad regime's favor in Syria. So I think there are limits to the demographic changes that can happen in certain areas. One other way to do that, we've seen that in Lebanon and other Arab countries, is to provide nationalities to non-Syrians. Yes. So are, have you documented such a trend in Syria? We did not mention it because we don't have proof, but we heard too much. And uh, we had enough information to have maybe 300 pages of in, the, in the report. But we only publish where we think it's bullet, more than bulletproof. But we heard that. Uh, they're getting, you know, they have, they, they have set up now the Fatimiyun Brigade in, uh, in, in Syria, which is a group, it's a, <coughs> it's a militia made of Shia Afghanis, you know, um, the sons and daughters, you know, the sons of uh, refugees who fled from Afghanistan or even from Afghanistan by the Maziris. They are there. You have hundreds, if not even thousands, especially in the Damascus region and around the uh, Sid Zainab uh, shrine uh, in Damascus. Um, you, voila. No, they're giving. They want Iranian citizenship. They want Iranian citizenship. Yeah. Yes, exactly, and they're getting it as a price if they go and fight. Yeah. But some are saying that, and some are getting it. That's what we heard, but we cannot prove yeah. it. You know, I'm very, le I'm very reluctant to say things where we're not bulletproof. But we hear a lot of that. Some are saying that, and they are also getting Shia Iraqis, which we heard, but still, but I you know. See how they want yeah. Iranian yeah. Yeah. But they're definitely, but they're definitely um, uh, giving apparently nationality, but not much. I think it started at some, at some point, then there were some rumors about it, and then they pulled the brake. Mm -hmm. And they're focusing now a lot on the Shiatization of Alawis. Yeah, and Ismailis, by the way, and Ismailis. Huh? And the Shia of Syria, also they're a bit brainwashing them to become a real good Shia, you know, the way they think it should be. Because they have, they have their own interpretation of Shia, Islam. During uh, like over photo. the course of the like U.S. engagement in mm -hmm. Iraq, um, almost $2 trillion was spent. There was over 100,000 U.S. troops on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yet still, despite the military, diplomatic, and development effort, we weren't able to create a situation where mm -hmm. Iran was not able to come in yeah. and create the kind of influence base it now has mm -hmm. there. And I'm just curious about your analysis. How are you seeing the kind of U.S. engagement you're talking about in Syria somehow creating a different result in terms mm -hmm. of Iranian influence there with so much smaller of a resource outlet. Yeah. Could I add to that? Please. Yeah. Please, Muhammad. I want to add, add a second part to your question. Because usually, you know, Iran mentioned as a part of the bad guys, which I, I agree in terms of the fight in Syria, but we've seen Iran engagement in Iraq that ousted Maliki out because ISIS took over a third of the, of the country. Mm -hmm. And some of the scenarios come up sometimes with, among Syrians that if ISIS took over lots of territories, Iran might kick Assad out but keep the regime in mm -hmm. where they can control. A uh, recipe sometimes Syrians refer to it as a negative mm -hmm. recipe because A, it gives lots of praise to ISIS' mm -hmm. role in Iraq and the success of, of mm -hmm. them getting Maliki out and might generate more public support for them. Uh, in Syria, and, and B, the majority of the regime will stay in Syria, mm -hmm. ruling Syria, even though Assad might be outside Syria. So how we can create that, that result that's different from the scenario? Look, it's a big debate, huh? I really try to make it very short with headlines. If you want, we can discuss about it later, because it's so interlinked, and you are right when you say it was a mess afterwards in, in, in Iraq with everything that was done there. Many things were badly done were badly done. The country was invaded, the regime was toppled, and then the, all the pro-Iranian Shia came back from Iran. And these guys worked systematically to take over the moment the American troops left. And when the American troops left, you know, the, Mr. Qasem Soleimani probably came to Malik and told him, okay, now we do what we want together. And he did it, okay. 
This is, it was many mistakes were done in Iraq. I'm really giving just headlines. Yeah? You can maybe ask the gentleman afterwards. I think I'm sure he can tell you a bit more in detail about that. In Syria, we're not asking to start a war now or to send boots on the ground, 200,000 troops or whatever. No, no, no. Americans should not now die in, to, to liberate Iraq, uh, pardon, Syria and Lebanon. We are asking for the right support for the right people to do it with logistical support and you know, a no-fly zone. And I'm sure many Arab countries and Turkey are, very, are willing to help in that also. Yeah? But we need the US leading in front, not from behind. It doesn't work like that. Everything is falling apart more and more. Yeah? In the policy recommendations we have formulated with a step-by-step, -step, we're not saying shoot first, ask questions later. We're saying you need to talk to the Iranians, give them an ultimatum. This is it. Enough is enough. You either do this and this and this, or we go to the UN. Then you go to the UN, and if the Russians and Chinese veto it, then you start helping the Syrians to stop the massacre there, and you implement a no-fly zone together as part of a strategy under the right to protect norm. This is how it should be done if you want to prevent that region from falling apart more and more. And then, and if you want to prevent that the president after Mr. Obama will inherit a much bigger problem. And I'm sure if this happens, the foreign policy legacy of the current president will not be positive. Yeah, okay, thank you, please. You've talked a lot about uh, Shia and Sunni, but um, in that, in Plan B, it yes. includes a large uh, whole valley of Christian communities. Yes. How did the Christians fall out in all of this? I'm very sorry to be a bit blunt with that. I think nobody cares there. Nobody cares. Nobody cares if the red line is in the middle. Mo most of the Christians there are anyhow ag gone. You know, it's a battle zone anyhow, Hama, Hummus, and the region around it. Most of the people there have left already. Either they left the country or they are on the coastline as internally displaced people. But the regime doesn't care. The Iranians don't care. Hezbollah doesn't care. And ISIS also doesn't care. You know? Whether they are Kurdish, Christian, or whatever, they don't care. Yeah. It's a very cynical extremely cynical people there, Cyn very cynical, you know, what up? Last question, yes sir. Ah, hey, you were last time there, last November. Um, my name is you were Mufa. sitting here, I remember. Um, you were sitting not here. really. <laughs> yes, yes. <coughs> my name is Mar Farouk, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Northampton. Uh, my question is, why won't you go to the Saudis and some other Arab countries to start pushing not the U.S. first, since the issue is um, in their own region. I didn't get the question. You have to repeat it. I'm sorry. Okay. In other words, um, you said you want the U.S. to lead. Yes. Why won't the Saudis and other Arab countries to start taking the lead, not the U.S.? Yeah, for a very simple reason, because only the U.S. has the resources and the power, and the power to lead and such a huge undertaking because it includes, if you start a process that might lead to a war against Iran in Syria, to end the killing and so on, you will have to have the U.S. You know, leading in that in order to manage any potential repercussions, security-wise, military-wise, along the border with Jordan, with Turkey, with Israel, maybe terror attacks from Hezbollah sleeping cells all over Europe and the world, and so on. It's a big thing. And then you need the the military support, meaning intelligence, satellite, you know, arms, and so on, it's the U.S. only who can do that. The war in Yemen, for example, now, to reinstate the legitimate president in Yemen can only happen, I mean, the Arab-led war, the Saudis and all their allies, you know, fighting there now uh, to reinstate the president that was kicked out by force. All of that cannot happen without American support. Weapons, ammunition, satellite images, targeting, and so on, logistics. It's impossible. You know, this is the role of the U.S. You are the global policeman, you know, it's your job. <laughs> it's your job. I'm sorry, guys, you cannot say, no, sorry, I'm staying at home, you know, and let, you know, uh, somebody like Assad and his friends from Iran kill uh, the Syrian people. Because you know? Obama doesn't want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, then, uh, then maybe something uh, was overread in the job description, you know? <laughs> you know. And we need to work on that. That's why we're here, you see. 
That's why we're here, to lobby on that and to convince Democrats we don't want you to bomb Iraq, uh, sorry, Iran. We don't want you to bomb Iran. We don't want you to go and invade Syria. We are not George W. Bush and co. No, we are something different. You know, it's something in the middle, you know. You cannot totally leave and leave from behind or invade without thinking what to do after you invade. It has to be a bit smarter, yeah? That's why we think this should happen, Ambassador. Fuad, thank you very much. As you can see, the Syria conflict is both tragic and exceptionally difficult to find the right set of policy mixes, but I think Naime Sham, mm -hmm. with the report that you did in November, mm -hmm. and the latest report focusing on mm -hmm. some of the legal aspects, I think you've made a huge contribution mm -hmm. towards helping people here in Washington and other capitals think about the right policy responses um, that have to be taken into consideration. So, thank Fouad, thank you again, and thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thank you.